Hello and welcome to Shoot.Edit's online training, three easy off-camera flash setups for wedding photographers with Matt Kennedy. My name is Caitlin Cooper and I'm the marketing coordinator here at Shoot.Edit. I'll be your host today with the majority of the training being conducted by Matt. So overall, the online training software is pretty simple. We encourage you to use the chat feature, which is located on the right side of your screen. We're going to be asking questions, but the best part about this is that it's an interactive training. You can carry on conversations with other attendees to get your questions answered. Also, note that the chats are live, so please be mindful and respectful. So for those of you who are new to Shoot.Edit, let me tell you a little bit about us. We are the first choice post-processing partner for the Wedding Pro in everything they shoot. We make your images look consistently awesome based on your chosen color profile. Fast is best and no one is faster. We provide turnaround time as fast as 48 hours. For this training, we've partnered with the International Academy of Wedding Photographers and White House Custom Color. So the International Academy of Wedding Photographers takes the utmost care in delivering the highest level of practical online education for wedding and portrait photographers. They aim to provide photographers with comprehensive online training and standardization on both shooting and building their business so photographers can provide a solid service to their clients. White House Custom Color is a professional photography and print partner. They ensure you get the same match style quality every time. Their consistent delivery and easy ordering process is second to none. They're consistently reinvesting in the company and planning for the future. All right, so off-camera flash setups. Of the challenging lighting scenarios you're faced with during the wedding day, the reception provides a handful of issues, especially regarding to lighting, that you have to overcome. From low light to up lighting to constant movement from your couples and guests, there's plenty of obstacles during the reception. How can you quickly create light and not miss any of the important moments? Today, Matt's gonna share his personal off-camera lighting setups to assist you during even the most difficult lighting scenarios. So a little bit about Matt. Matt has been running a successful wedding photography business for over 10 years with his wife, Carissa. Matt is the director at the International Academy of Wedding Photographers, which is a program to take portrait and wedding photographers from start to finish in running a successful, thriving photography business. When Matt and Carissa are not shooting or teaching, they're running around on field trips, birthday parties, and activity activities with their three kids, Caitlin, Zachary, and Gracie. So Matt, we're, we're so excited to have you with us today. Um, it's been a while since we've done one of these together. I think it was uh, last year that we did one and uh, Carissa was there with us for that one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's, uh, thanks for having me. It's, this is a lot of fun for us. And so we're, we're privileged to be able to, to speak with you, of course, Caitlin, and, and all of your audience. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and um, I, I'm i lucky because I got a little sneak peek of your presentation and um, <laughs> I'm, I'm like super excited about it. And I'm really, really excited for everybody who's joining us today to get to learn from you guys. Um, and, you know, just as a little teaser for everyone here, like they're showing some really, really awesome setups and um, <laughs> without, I don't want to give too much away, but. <laughs> um, yeah, I see. <laughs> it, I, I know, sorry. <laughs> I just, no, you know, what <laughs> when I see things like that, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so cool. So yeah. anyways, uh, you know, why don't we, we just kind of jump right in and um, you guys can, uh, you know, get your notebooks ready. Like you guys are going to have a lot of notes. We're going to have some really great links to share with you guys throughout to even learn more than what Matt's going to be sharing with you guys today. So, you know, um, that being said, Matt, why don't you kick us off? Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Caitlin, for that awesome intro. Um, <laughs> it's, it's so funny to like hear people talk about like our story and and kind of where we started and where we are now and um we are like we love being wedding photographers and and also educators in this industry and we've just we've gained so much uh, ourselves from it that we're just stoked to be able to kind of give back to the to the industry that helped us so yeah we um we are now essentially just like you said we are um running the international academy of wedding photographers which is, uh, it really is an honor to be able to speak with so many people from so many areas around the world, 
that are just striving to be um, to be better in certain areas, in all areas, and starting from whatever place they are. And and seeing the amount of uh, change that happens in people is is incredible to be a part of. So um, in the academy, um, I actually teach the off camera flash course, the flash photography course. Um, so I got a little bit to say about this uh, in in the course in the academy. We talked for about eight hours of video, so <laughs> we, don't worry, we won't go that long for you guys. Um, but I will cover some great stuff um, about how to use off-camera flash in a way that's going to help you get the images that you really want to get. Um, but also, just like it says here on the slide, they're easy. Okay, so three easy off-camera flash lighting setups for receptions. Um, so that's my goal is to help you um, understand flash a little bit more um, and to get to the point that you actually enjoy it and that you have an easy time using your flash to get the images you want. Um, so I'm going to just jump right into this um, because I know you guys are looking forward to that um, because that's why you're here. So let's move on into you need to know how to use flash. You cannot do off-camera flash photography if you don't know how to use flash. Um, but also importantly is you need to know when to use flash. This is one of the things that I always mention at the beginning of talking about off-camera flash and flash in general, um, but more specifically off-camera flash is that you need to know when to use it. You don't need to use it all the time. Uh, it doesn't need to be something uh, that is, is pulled out of your hat all the time because you want to, um, because sometimes it actually uh, gets in the way of something. Um, so sometimes the amount of time it takes to set up your off-camera flash will get in the way of something else, an image that could have been taken, um, something that could have happened at the, at the wedding at that moment. Um, so I want you to always remember you need to use off-camera flash. You need to know how, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about settings. We're going to talk about gear and, and diagrams to show you how to do this. But you also really need to know when so that you're doing your best for your clients, so that you're getting the images that they want, um, and you're not spending more time doing something for fun just because you want to, but you're actually doing your best job for your clients. Um, so we're going to talk about two things here on-camera flash versus off-camera flash. We are talking about three easy off-camera flash lighting setups. Um, so off-camera flash is the main thing, but I want you to remember that there is always a lot you can do with on-camera flash. All that the flash is doing is allowing you to get an image captured well. Um, you can shoot a lot of things with natural light. A lot of people will say I'm a natural light photographer, but using flash, can help you get a better image without completely changing the look of your image and your style. Um, one of the things that we talk a lot about in our full course is how to allow flash to keep your style throughout the day so that you don't have a stark contrast between all the images you shot during the day in daylight and then during the evening at the reception. Because if you don't know how to use your flash gear well enough, your reception lighting may actually cause your total style of imagery to change and the, uh, the feel of your images. So we wanna get you comfortable with knowing on-camera flash and off-camera flash so that you can stay true to your style. I think that's really important. So with on-camera flash, I think most of you who have used a flash on your camera know about bounce flash. If you don't, bounce flash just means that you are gonna bounce the light behind you or above you or beside you off of something, usually a wall or a ceiling, and then it's gonna put a soft light on the person that is essentially right in front of you. So you're, here's an example. You're trying to light up a person, and so in this case, this bride is in a dark room, uh, but there happened to be a, uh, just to the side of us, a, a pretty white um, array of uh, art, I guess it was. Um, so there was a, a light section to the wall. And so when we first were taking these images in this area, it was so dark and there was terrible lighting coming straight down from this 20 foot ceiling that she would just have raccoon eyes and it was, it was just not, it was not nice, but we really wanted to use this area. So we used on camera bounce flash and it literally took five seconds to get set up. I faced my camera towards her. I faced my flash head towards the white that I was gonna bounce off of. So the wall that's just to the right hand side where she's looking. And it did it 
<laughs> it's like magic. It, we're using TTL settings on an on-camera flash bouncing. It just works. And so it's a really easy way. I could have set up off-camera flash and got this image. I could have potentially maybe gotten it a little bit better even. Like I could have done something to make it even better. Um, but I was able to get this shot in literally five seconds from getting there by using on-camera bounce flash. So I wanna use this example just to let you know and give you permission that you don't always have to be thinking, okay, off-camera flash, what is the most crazy thing I can do? Sometimes you just wanna get a great image and using bounce flash is the best way to do that quickly so you can move on and get your couple more images. So, but what if there aren't white walls and ceilings? What if we're in a dark room and there is nothing to bounce off? What if we're outside? What if there's nothing that we can bounce the, the light off of? So do we just use direct flash? Like do we point our flash from our camera right towards the couple or, or whatever we're shooting? Well, no, because then you'd be lighting up everything in front of you. You'd have a very flat light right on the person. So there's no dimension to the light at all. And it would be a more boring look to the light. The image would look less professional. Um, direct flash is not ideal in most cases. So because it looks terrible, we have off-camera flash. So off-camera flash is something that you can do in any room, in any situation, wherever you are, but specifically when there's nothing to bounce your on-camera flash off of and where there are specifically no walls at all if you're outside. So a couple examples. There is no way that we could have done this image and got a sunset color in the background while having them lit up if we didn't use on-camera flash, or uh, sorry, off-camera flash. If we used on-camera flash, the floor in front of us would be more lit up than the couple because the floor is closer to us and the light as it travels gets darker as it goes. So using off-camera flash, we're able to light them up so they're not a silhouette anymore and we're able to capture the color in the sunset in the background. Here's just another, op uh, uh, another example of the same thing. We're setting our settings to capture the sunset. So that's our exposure, our ambient exposure is capturing the color of the sunset. But then we use an off-camera flash, and in this case, it was just a bare bulb off-camera flash. You can tell by how strong these shadows are in the sand. But literally, this was uh, at, on, a, on a beach at a resort wedding, and they were dancing off to the side. We saw the sunset come. We ran there, and this uh, little session of photos took us maybe two minutes. So we didn't actually have a lot of time, and we didn't need it because we got a great image that they love that looks great and is using, in this case, off-camera flash off to the side. And you can tell the angle this is coming from. So it's coming from the left-hand side of this image and the flash is lighting them up. My, my uh, settings for the exposure are set for the sunset and it works together. It makes them stand out so they're not a silhouette. So these are things that you can do with off-camera flash. But now I wanna direct you to this. This is, this is well, it's not my hat, but this is a hat. Um, this is how I think of off-camera flash. I think of it as a hat. Okay, maybe this is more along your lines. I don't know whoever's <laughs> watching this right now, but think of think of this as um, as a hat. You need to use it when you have to. So if it's raining out, so you, you'd use a hat. Or when you just feel like it. So sometimes you want to put this hat on because you just kind of feel like it. Sometimes you wear it because it's super sunny and you need to get the sun out of your eyes and you probably wear sunglasses as well, but you know, sometimes you'll throw on a hat, but again, you need to use it when you have to, or when you just feel like it. So that's how I want you to think about flash is don't use it all the time, but also don't shy away from it. If it's too dark out and you need to use flash, use flash and don't just rely on your ISO going higher and higher and higher because you're a natural light photographer. Learn how to use flash to your advantage so that you can get natural images with flash. Or when you just feel like it, if you know that you've got time, that you've got a really cool idea and it's gonna be something that your clients are gonna love and they're gonna value the fact that you spent more time to get that cool image, then go for it. There's so many things you can do with off-camera flash that it will, as you get into this and as you start experimenting, it will blow your mind what you can do with off-camera flash. Um, if you want to just get inspired a little bit, you need to go check out Two Man. So Two Man Studios, that's Erica and, um, uh, oh, sorry, what's his name? <laughs> uh, 
Lanny and Erica Mann. I, I said her name first, so it got me mixed up. Lanny and Erica Mann, um, M-A-N-N, Two Man Studios. They have some incredible work with off-camera flash that, again, just by experimenting with things, they're able to get incredible looking images because they feel like it. And sometimes they have to, but a lot of times it's because that's what they want to deliver to their clients. So we're going to do a little bit of quick gear talk here. I'm going to explain a few of the things that you have to kind of know how to use and what we will be talking about. Um, I, again, I can't go into huge amounts of detail on this because we're in a webinar right now, but I'm going to show you some things and, and talk about this stuff. And then we're going to have a couple questions after that before we like really dive into the setups. So quick gear talk, transmitters and receivers. This is kind of what you need to do off camera flash. Your, your flash is physically going to be off of your camera. So you need some way for your camera to talk to your flash. And what these devices do is it allows your camera to think that it literally has the flash on top of it. Your camera um, is connected to your flash through a transmitter and a receiver. Now, there are also um, like options that you can do with transmitters and receivers because you can now have more than one flash. If you just had your flash on top of your camera, that's all you can attach. But now that you have a transmitter and receivers, like you see here, there's three receivers and one transmitter. That's going to allow you to have more flashes going off at the exact same time and the exact same image control what you do with it. This is where um, the, the kind of artistic side of you is going to come out because you are going to get to go with your ideas and control the situation. So we've got a transmitter on the camera. It's going to transmit the signal that says go. <laughs> it's, it's like, I'm ready to shoot and go, send the flash. That's all it's saying. And your receiver is going to say, oh, go? Okay, go. Yeah, send the flash. So that's what a manual receiver is doing. Um, we'll talk a little bit about TTL. Don't get ahead of me here, but um, that's what a manual trigger is doing. It's telling the flash exactly when to go off. Now there's also transceivers. So as you can tell, I'm going to go back here. Look at the top of the camera here, the transmitter that is on there. It has a button, which is a test button, so that you could test the flashes. But it doesn't have any way to connect the camera, aside from if you used a cord and you know all that fun stuff. But as you look at this transmitter, it attaches to the top of the camera, so it takes up that spot for the flash, but it doesn't allow you to attach a flash separately from that. Now a transceiver, in most cases, does because it can do both. It's a transmitter and receiver, and they can be used interchanging. Interchange, inter, I don't know. It, you can interchange them. Um, so a transceiver is something that you want to look at as an option. Um, nowadays, they are get, coming down a lot lower in price, being more affordable and more sturdy. Um, these ones actually that you see right here are the ones that I use, Yongnuo YN622Cs. Uh, I use 622Ns because I'm a Nikon shooter. I hate admitting like those kinds of things because I feel like I've now put a wall in between me and you Canon shooters, but <laughs> it's okay. We can get past it. Um, so Yongnuo, um, Yongnuo stuff, Yongnuo gear, flashes, and their uh, transceivers I think are great. Um, so I would definitely um, suggest you look into them as an option. Um, one of the reasons they are great is because they have lots of options for channels. Like you can see here, there's three channels with three options for each of those, A, B, and C. But then there's also the ability to do TTL through these transceivers, which means it's not just a manual um, transmitter anymore. It's not just saying, okay, go now. It's able to say, okay, go now and at this amount of power. And so it can it can talk back and forth between your flashes and your camera so that you get the right amount of flash out automatically. Um, anyways, we're gonna keep it at manual talk today, um, just so you know, but um, manual uh, shooting through transceivers is possible. And the thing I wanna just point out to you that you can see there is that the camera is connected to the transceiver and you can put a flash on top of the transceiver. So that allows you to have on-camera flash always. Like you always have your flash on your camera just in case you need to have that flash going off to light them up from in front. But you can always also have that flash not go off and have the other flashes go off so that you have off-camera flash in your shot. So that's kind of the transceiver idea um, and that is the one that I would suggest that you look at. Now there is another option that doesn't need transceivers or receivers and transmitters because it has it built in. Um, now, there are other options of this. I'm just kind of put it, pointing out the most obvious one, which is the Canon 600EX-RT. RT stands for radio transmitter. So what that means is that this flash 
built in has a radio transmitting function that can talk to other flashes of the same kind. So if you have more than one of these flashes, they can talk to each other and you can have them set up so that they sync and so that you can use off camera flash without actually having transceivers or transmitters and receivers. Um, so there are, just like we've said, there are, are young low systems of um, flashes and triggers. There are other options out there that are not necessarily the Canon version or the Nikon version that you can look at. But one of the things you wanna just think about is if you don't already have transceivers and you're looking at options, just price out the difference between um, buying new flashes that don't have radio transmitters in them and adding transceivers to your order or getting new flashes that have radio transmitters built in. Then essentially you're attaching less things, there's less connection points, there's less batteries that you need. Um, there's, there's a lot of reasons that you would like uh, this kind of system over using transceivers. But for most of us out there who have some flashes already that don't have radio transmitters in them, it's much cheaper to uh, get transceivers and go that route with your gear purchases. Okay, now I have to mention speed lights or strobes because a lot of people, um, you, when using off-camera flash, are thinking, okay, are we just talking about those little lights or are we talking about like the big lights that can, that can overpower the sun and like, <laughs> and use huge modifiers and are you ready for the eight foot octobank and like that kind of stuff. Um, speed lights or strobes, I'm just gonna kind of flat out say, um, for the most part, 95% of wedding photographers out there are using speed lights on the wedding day. Now that is not to say that strobes are not the way to go. There are a lot of people, good friends of ours, Justin and Mary Morantz are, are one of the um, people that I would think of that use strobes really well on uh, weddings, especially at receptions. And it's because of the system that they use for their flash that they're not moving it very often. And so you pay a little bit more money for a strobe that has a battery pack, uh, but you get a great quality flash. There are a lot of uh, drawbacks that comes with speed lights and that comes with strobes. So you need to just kind of make up your mind as far as how, um, how portable do you need things to be? How fast do you need your flashes to reboot so you can shoot again? And what kind of power output do you need? Do you need it to be very strong uh, or do you need it to be actually very low? And what I mean by that is strobes have kind of a minimum amount of light that they can put out on, on a single shot. And for a lot of the way that I shoot, that's actually too much. So for speed lights, a lot of times I'm using speed lights at almost no power at all and it's getting exactly what I want. Um, so for those of you who are out there that are shooting with their speed lights, at like one over two and one over four and having a big pop of flash from their speed lights often. Um, I just wanna let you know that I'm gonna tell you why you don't need to do that and why you can actually go with a lower amount of flash output so that you can shoot faster. Recycle time. All right, and so you don't use as many batteries, which is always a headache. Um, so speed lights or strobes, you're gonna make up your mind. And then again, modifiers and accessories. There are lots of things that you can use to uh, kind of enhance the look of the flash that you have. So we're not always just shooting bare bulb flash. Sometimes you'll use an umbrella. Sometimes you'll use a snoot. A snoot, just to quickly mention it, is, is basically like a cone that goes over top of your flash that can direct the flash out into a beam, like a circle of light, rather than spreading the light. Uh, you can also use a grid. Uh, one of the things that I use is a softbox uh, umbrella grid combo. So there's a grid, which is a, a, a grid of usually black um, material, black fi uh, fabric, yeah, that's the word, uh, which allows your light to go in the one direction really well, but it cuts it off from going too wide. Um, so it, it allows the path of your light to be much more narrow, but still soft when using an umbrella or a softbox. So then there's a softbox, of course, and if you've seen those, that's with the white face on the front of it, and they're usually uh, kind of popped out like an umbrella would. There's also gels that you can use. CTO gels is the most common one, which is a orange colored gel. What that does is it allows your flash to, instead of be the natural like sunlight color, it allows your flash to be more suited towards lights that would be inside a house, inside a, a building. So sometimes if you want your flash to not stand out, and if you want your flash to have the same color temperature as the lights in a building, you'll use a gel. And so I have uh, little CTO gel caps that I put on my flashes. Um, it allows me to get the similar um, color light to my flash as is in the room. Now, sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you want the 
warmness of the room to be shown and you want the flash color to be uh, natural on the skin tones of the person. Again, that's a personal choice thing, but just know that there are CTO gels out there that you might wanna consider using. Also, you're gonna have to get some stands. So again, pretty simple. You just need some stands to put the flashes up on. You also normally will need a cold shoe or flash foot. So those are those little plastic things that probably came with your flash when you bought it, uh, but you can attach your flash to it so that it stands on its own uh, or that it goes onto a stand or you attach your transceiver to it and then you attach your flash to your transceiver and etc. There are so many more things that you could get. Uh, we can't get into all of them, but just know that there are modifiers and accessories that you can use. But again, I need to give you permission to uh, not go overboard, not get gas, which is gear acquisition syndrome. Um, you, don't, you don't need to go too far overboard with all the stuff you have. You need to always keep in mind that you are trying to get the best product for your clients. That is the goal. So that is our quick gear talk. Now we have a time for a quick Q&A. Um, what I'd love to do here is just answer a couple questions, Caitlin, that maybe you have um, that is about gear um, or about uh, anything that we've talked about so far about knowing how and when to use Flash. Yeah, so thank you for all that uh, information. That was super helpful, just kind of getting an overview of different gear that you should be using. Um, so some really quick questions here. Uh, when it comes to you know your flashes, how many do you recommend somebody has? And maybe that's more specifically the shots that you're going to be going into uh, later today. You know how many how many flashes are you using in those? For sure. Um I would say that you should, uh, if you if you want to be using off-camera flash in your photography for receptions, you should have two. So a lot of people will think, oh, I can just put the transmitter on my camera and then I can have my flash go off camera and I'm only using one. But you're very limited with the amount of um, flash work that you can do if you only have one flash. So what I would always recommend is um, go with a off-brand flash for your second flash. So if you have one main flash, that's the one you use on your camera all the time, and let's say you're a Canon shooter and you have a Canon flash for your main flash. Well, if money is tight and you don't want to really go and buy three or four new Canon flashes, um, even if you just you can't afford to get one more right now, I would suggest that if you want to use off-camera flash in your work, you should have two flashes and you should at least have a set of transmitter receivers, um, which can allow you to have either one, cam one flash on camera and one flash off camera. Or ideally, you would also be able to have um, three of those transceivers so that you can have your transceiver on your camera and have two flashes off camera. There's a lot that you can do as far as the creativity of your imagery if you can have two off camera flashes. I would highly suggest that. Great. And, you know, obviously, uh, it's very important that you have batteries to fill all of your flashes, you know, at the get go. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm sure, you know, it's probably recommended that you have extra ones. You know, do you do you have a right. recommendation for how many batteries somebody should be coming to weddings with? Do you recommend rechargeable batteries um, versus just the kind of one time use batteries? Right. That's a great question. Um, it's funny. I'm actually literally looking at my battery charger right now that I just <laughs> took my batteries out of because we're shooting tomorrow. <laughs> um, so my recommendation, if you are um, shooting more than 10 to 15 weddings per year, more than, let's say, a couple um, sessions per month that you use Flash for, my suggestion would be that you use rechargeable batteries uh, because it's going to save you money in the long run um, if you're shooting enough. Now, also, the benefit that you get from rechargeable batteries is they usually have a higher milliamp hour, I think that's what they call it, MAH um, like rating. So these ones that I'm looking at right now, I'm using um, Energizer rechargeable batteries. Um, I also just got some ones from Amazon, the Amazon Basics ones, and they're really good and much cheaper. Uh, but these are 2300 milliamp hour batteries. Um, I would suggest those um, that you get some. But then what I would suggest is that you actually own twice as many as what you need. Now that seems like a lot when you uh, when you got like five flashes and six triggers. Um, but you should at least own twice as many as what you need because these, these really do have a lifetime. Like they will run out over time um, and you don't want to be on a shoot and needing to use all of your stuff, but you can't because some of your batteries died. Um, so I would suggest that you try to get twice as many as what you need. If not, go for 1.5. So if you have four flashes and each flash takes four batteries, you should have at least eight additional batteries that you can swap out. 
Um, this is going under the assumption that you're using your flash to a normal amount, an acceptable amount um, during the wedding day, which means that for a couple of your flashes, you may have to change your batteries. Now, we are also going to talk about how to use your settings so that you don't have to change batteries quite as often, which is really important. I think a lot of people out there are making the mistake of shooting with too high of an output for their flash so that they actually go through their batteries way faster than they need to. Um, so my suggestion would be rechargeable batteries, one, one and a half or twice as many as what you actually use with your setup. And let me also just mention um, that this charger that I have, it's by Maha. M-A-H-A, -A, Maha, it's an eight cell, one hour battery charger. Um, I'm gonna actually give you the exact model number, MHC801D. So this is my favorite battery charger for sure because it can charge eight cells at one time, but the best part about it is that it charges each of them individually to they need rather than charging all of the batteries to the lowest common, is what most cheap battery cell chargers do. Now, most people don't know this, that when they get the battery charge that comes batteries batteries is lower than the other three it's only going to charge the batteries up to whatever those other three were at so that means that okay maybe those other three got to full charge but that one that was really low only got to like a quarter of a charge and it says that it's done now the same thing happens if you only have one battery that's really good and three batteries that are really bad three batteries won't get charged very much. It'll only get charged and it'll turn off the charging as soon as that first battery has come to full charge. Um, so that would be my suggestion is this Maha charger. <laughs> That's awesome. Great, well, you know, why don't we just keep on going? I love that. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so we will have more Q&A later, just so you know. Um, so we're gonna talk about the three easy setups now. So there's three ways that I would say, there are, there are more things that you can do, but these are three things that you can use in almost every situation. In almost every room, you can use these setups uh, to get the kind of images you're gonna want with your photography. Number one is an on-camera flash with a kicker. Okay, so the kicker is something that just adds dimensional light. The kicker adds dimensional light, which means the flash that you use off-camera, that's what we're calling our kicker, is something that's coming from the side or from behind that's gonna add dimension to the image so that it's not a flat image. The on-camera flash, if used just as on-camera, face forward, and even sometimes if it's used as a bounce, uh, a bounce flash, is much more flat. Whereas a kicker can allow light to come in from the side, which is gonna allow for a lot more uh, highlights and shadows, which adds dimension to your images, makes it more interesting. Um, so it adds dimension. Now, you can have this kicker in or out of the frame. That really is your preference. Um, there, are, there are a lot of people, the tried and true photography gurus, who will say that if the flash is seen in your image, it's wrong. <laughs> so you're just wrong if you see it in your image. Um, but really, it's your preference. Um, if you like the look of the image with the flash being seen in it and it adds more um, excitement and pop to the image that you love, then you go for it. You do you. If you are going to put that into a photography contest, you may lose, <laughs> but that's okay. You know what? You're trying to get, again, the best product for your clients, and you're trying to go for the look that suits your style. So in or out of frame, totally your preference. Doesn't matter um, to me, whatever you do, but just know that there is the option of having it uh, being seen in the image. So as you see in this image, we can see that the, the flash is in the frame. We can see the flash physically. And now I'm, I don't actually love it because we can even see the stand that the flash is on, which uh, I'll just, I won't worry about it too much, but um, we can see the flash in here. So this kicker that's coming into the image is adding a lot. So look at the girl's hair in the top. It's, it's lighting her hair up from behind, which makes her glow, which just looks cool. Uh, it even lights up the outline of his arm. The lady on the left-hand side, it lights up her back and hair as well. Um, so it's doing a lot, this kicker. It's doing a lot to the image. But it being in the image itself as well just adds a little bit more kind of excitement to it. We know that they're dancing and having fun, um, but it adds a little bit more to it. And then, of course, we can see them. They're lit up clearly because of the on-camera flash. Um, so we are able to light up the front of them with the on-camera flash, and the kicker is allowing for the backlight. Here's a little diagram just to show you kind of what's going on. Um, you, you'll see that in this diagram, there's a 
I, I guess I can't point to it with my mouse, but uh, next to the camera, on the right-hand side of the camera, you see that little symbol that I kind of tried to make. What that simple, uh, symbol means is a flash that is coming from camera angle. Um, whether or not I'm holding it in my hand off of a boom or if it's on the camera, um, that's, again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But anyways, we've got two flashes going on here. That flash that's in the back, then there's the people in between the camera and the flash, the kicker in the back, and then there's a the flash in the front. Um, so I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna share something with you guys. Um, this lighting diagram and tons more are available for you guys. I'm gonna explain a few of the lighting diagrams as we go through the session, but you can actually download more right now. Um, so if you go to this link, I'll just leave it up here for a couple more seconds, um, you'll be able to just get it emailed straight to you. So put your email in, we'll be able to email you right away with more lighting diagrams. I think there's, uh, there's over 20 of them. I can't remember how many there are, um, but, uh, Check out this uh, link, bit.ly slash lighting diagrams, and then you'll get uh, more lighting diagrams sent right to you. Okay, here's another um, just example. This is actually a really fun wedding, but um, this was shot in a theater, and so they had a lot of lighting and stuff figured out for the stage, uh, but it was black walls, black ceiling, nothing that you could ever possibly bounce your light off of. Um, so obviously, we used some kickers in this, and in this case, the kicker is actually being blocked by his head. So that light behind the blue smoke there, that is my flash going off. The flash is lighting up the side of her body, the bride, who's actually singing to her husband, who's in the foreground here. And it's lighting up the smoke from behind. When I didn't have that flash going off, um, you basically couldn't see all of the dimension of the smoke that was going on because it wasn't being lit up. But once my, my flash was behind the smoke, then it would light all of the smoke up as well. Um, so that's what the flash is doing in here. The kicker is kind of lighting up things coming back towards the camera. But because I blocked it with the, the groom's head there, it's not uh, being the, like, a, it's not necessarily the uh, white flash of light that we had in that other image. Um, so that that's a kicker being used in this situation. And it doesn't really move. But sometimes you will move around the situation, around the scene. So in this case, I had one flash off to the side. And again, look at the shadows. You can see which side my flash is on. Okay, coming to the right, that's the little test for you. Um, you can see that my flash as a kicker was coming from the side, but I actually went and just kind of stood closer to it. So now I'm not on the other side of the flash. Now I'm using the kicker kind of as my main light. So it's lighting up them. It's giving dimension to the photo, showing shadows on her back, but light on her side. And same thing with their faces. Um, but it's making them pop. It's making them stand out instead of the background barn and all the other things. Okay, so they are the brightest part of the image. Um, so in this situation, like you can see here, I actually came closer to the kicker. The kicker didn't move. I kept the stand where it was. As the couple was dancing, I moved around, went to a symmetrical spot, and had the flash coming in from the side. So now it's a main light. That's one of the things that you can do with a kicker is uh, as you move around, you're switching between having it as the main light and having it as a kicker, as a background light. Think about that for a second. Think about the kicker and on-camera flash combination. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna talk more about settings soon, but I wanted to see if there are any quick questions about having a kicker in your image and having an on-camera flash to fill the front of it. Yeah, so let's see, we'll just do one quick question. I have a couple, but we'll save some for the end here. So okay. you were just talking about um, the kicker and how, especially in that last image, you just kept it right there and you moved around. Um, yep. How often are you actually moving the kicker light? Do you try to find a spot in the reception and keep it there the whole time? Or what's your process for that? That's a great question. Um, okay, so a lot of times if I'm using just one kicker, and I'm using an on-camera flash, it's because I haven't brought all my other stuff. So if I'm on like a destination wedding or something that I'm not bringing a lot of stuff, um, or if the room just doesn't necessarily call for or need more than one light. Now, a lot of times what you'll think of is, if I'm gonna put up one flash, where am I going to be when I'm gonna be backlighting something I want to backlight? And where can I have it be where I want to have it as a front light? Um, so one of the things you want to think about at a reception specifically is the times of, like, of things that happen at the reception. So uh, there are speeches normally at receptions. And if you want to use flash for your speeches, you're probably going to want some light on the person who's doing the speaking. And usually most podiums are close to the head table. 
Um, but you're probably going to want some light on them. And then you're also probably going to want some light on the people at the head table. Then, if you think of it, if you had your flash at the back of the room so that it could light up the podium and the people at the head table, if you come around the head table and shoot over their shoulders towards the laughing parents that are in the, the crowd sitting at their tables, now you've actually got a kicker ready to go. And it's going to add more dimension to your, to your image. Um, so there's lots of things that you can think about. Um, but really, for myself, if I'm using one light, I'm probably going to move it. Um, based on the, the section of the day that we're in. Um, when it's the speeches time, I'll have it in one place and I won't move it. When it goes from speeches to uh, the first dance, I will move it for that. And again, I'm thinking of where can I use it as a front light and where can I use it as a back light, as a kicker. Um, so I'm finding a place that I can use it for both. And then when I get to from the first dances to more of the kind of party dancing, I might move it again. Um, but again, that just depends on the room and on what's going to actually be happening at the time. You know, that, that was some really great advice. I love how uh, you said, always think about how you can be using your kicker as a front light and a back light. I think that's a mm -hmm. great piece of advice, um, you know, especially as you're moving through, you know, especially the reception time, because there are so many different events that do happen. So I think uh, a yeah. great, great piece of advice there. Awesome. Okay. Do you want to move on? Yeah, let's do it. Perfect. So this is number two. So now we're talking about uh, symmetrical room lights with on camera flash. So as you can see, I said room lights. That means we're actually going to three lights now. So uh, this is a setup that you can do that is still an easy setup to do, but it requires three flashes. Um, if you think about it, you can always get rid of the on-camera flash because in this situation, some of the examples I'll show you, the on-camera flash doesn't always go off. But for the most part, the important part of this is the symmetrical room lights. Um, so it is your choice where you line up the symmetry. Is it on the dance floor? Is it around the head table? Is it around the speech podium? Uh, is it just in the main room in general? Um, it's really up to you what you want to make the symmetrical lineup around. I would say at probably 80% of the weddings that I do, I choose the dance floor. And I, I wait to do my symmetrical lineup with my symmetrical flashes uh, and my on-camera flash. I wait to do that until it gets time for dancing. Um, because when I have two flashes at a symmetrical point and I line them up so that when I'm able to shoot a first dance happening in the middle of the dance floor, I have a beautiful symmetry lined up with the walls and everything. Um, it just looks so much better. So dance floor is usually what I go for. Um, ideally, the head table is centered with the dance floor. Again, every room's different, but that's just one of those things that you hope for. Um, so symmetrical room lights with on-camera flash is the next thing we're gonna talk about. Um, so here's the setup. In this building, it was actually a really hard building to shoot in because there's all these pillars everywhere and people were, and their tables were scattered all around the pillars. And so this was a really hard room to, to shoot in and find good spots for. But as you can see on the right and the left at two symmetrical spots, I've got flashes that are just sitting right on the, um, the kind of between those two pillars, right on the ledge. So my flashes aren't on stands right now. They're actually just sitting there right on the ledge. Hopefully people don't knock them over, uh, but they're pointed back towards the dance floor. So the couple that's in the middle of the dance floor doing their first dance, they're being uh, backlit by both of these, kind of back and side lit. And then uh, my flash, the in this case, my, my on-camera flash uh, was not on. If it was on, then the people that were in the watching the first dance, uh, that, I want the focus to be on the couple. So I was able to control the light by having the flashes point right towards the middle of the dance floor. And then they're getting a little bit of light bounced back on them by things like the tablecloth and by the pillars. Um, they're getting some light bounced back, but most of it is just ambient light that's there. Um, so this is a symmetrical lineup of the flashes so that you can get a symmetrical image. So again, just to kind of recap where they are there in a certain place. My camera is symmetrical to the two flashes that are on the sides and those flashes on the sides are pointed to the middle of the dance floor. They're not pointed out to the sides of the room. They're not pointed up to the ceilings. They're pointed right to the middle of the dance floor. 
So anytime I shoot from this angle straight on in between the two symmetrical flashes, I can have flashes on each side and it looks great. They are side lit, they're backlit. It's a, it's a great way to get uh, a lot of um, kind of the ambient uh, emotion that's going on. Uh, also, if you can just imagine my camera moving over to the side. So if I go all the way, all the way to the right hand side where those guys with the orange hair are, um, if I was over there, now I would have a front light, the one right beside me, that's coming in at a bit of an angle, and I would have a backlight. So my two symmetrical lights can actually now be used as a front and a backlight. Now picture myself going over to the other side, so going to the left side. Now my left symmetrical light is a front light, and my, my right symmetrical light is a backlight. Now if I stand right in between the two, now I have two front lights, which is actually a really great way to get um, to get photos of groups of people. Um, if you want to do uh, family photos, uh, group photos on the dance floor, it's one of those things that sometimes just ends up happening. Having two symmetrical lights actually works out really well because it lights them up quite well. Um, so you can, in this situation, move all the way around here and have different lighting for each setup that you have, each thing that's going on without moving your flashes at all. You're just moving your body. Uh, uh, and again, out there is the option. You can use it to light up the people more, or you can turn it off so that you can shoot through things and you can shoot from a further distance while you still have the dance floor lit up. Here's another option. This is actually similar. Uh, it's that same wedding that I showed earlier with the, the kicker in the back. That kicker to the left-hand side hasn't moved. But now on the right hand side, you actually can't see it in the shot, um, but on the right hand side in the stairway that's going up to where I was shooting from, there's another light. And this is what I would call symmetrically lighting up the room. So this isn't just the dance floor, but these are two opposing flashes, one coming from one side, one coming from the complete opposite side. So now they're both pointing towards the middle of the room so now I can go pretty much from any angle in this whole room and I will either have side lighting like I have in here. So if you look at some of these people's bodies, you can see that the portion of their body that's facing me is dark, but on the left side and the right side of their bodies, it's light because it's lit up by two flashes. Or I could stand on the other side and have one being a main light, one being a backlight, a kicker. Or again, I could stand on the other side where the head table is down there and I could have the same type of lighting that I have right from this angle, but a different angle. Oh, and there's my beautiful wife in there underneath the lamppost shooting the bass player. <laughs> but then I could go even up on stage and I could shoot down to the dance floor and again have that kicker that's on the left hand side be my main light now. And then have the kicker that's on the back side, uh, the staircase, actually be a kicker. So that's what I would call symmetrically lighting the room. So I'm having two lights come in from opposing sides. Okay. That's the second one. So that's symmetrically lighting up the room, either the dance floor, the head table, the podium, or the room, and having an on-camera flash as an option. Any questions about doing this kind of thing symmetrically, Caitlin? Uh, yes, I've got one for you. So what happens, uh, this is kind of a, a, a two-part question. One, what if, what if the room is a really weird shape and it doesn't actually, you know, like this example that, sh that you showed, especially the, the first dance image with the beautiful pillars, like that was a perfectly symmetrical room. Uh, right. What happens if you don't have that? Um, or equally, what happens if there's just a ton of objects in the way? And so you, it, it's challenging to put the lights at a almost symmetrical position. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Something to just keep in mind is that sometimes uh, not every room is able to do every type of lighting situation you might want to do. Um, but also to be a little bit more bold with where you're capable and ready to and willing to put your flashes. Um, if you have your flashes synced up or, or like cinched up nice and tight on the stands and you are able to put things around your stands so that they don't get knocked over, I would suggest having your flashes right up onto the corners of the dance floor and then your flashes actually create symmetry. As long as you stand in a spot that is going to be uh, shooting right towards them and, and, and in between the two of them, you can actually create symmetry with the flashes going off without having to have symmetry in the walls around you. Um, so thinking of it as 
the flash getting up to a point where you will see it in the image, like you can in this image in, with the pillars, you can see the flashes in the image. Um, yes, the room is very symmetrical and that adds to the kind of impact of the image. But if it was a room that just had two symmetrical flashes off to the side and it didn't matter what the room was, you could still make the image look great and look symmetrical because of those two flashes going off. Um, so if you wanna do a symmetrical setup so that you have that look, now you can really do it in any room. I would just move things closer to where you're trying to focus the light. Um, as well, always remember that you want the lights to be uh, directed towards the middle of the dance floor. That way, that is what's being lit up and nothing else. And then like you were saying, if there's lots of things in the way, or like even in this case, when we were so far back and we were shooting through people, um, it didn't matter where I went, the light on them was always the same. No matter what I did, they always had the same light on them because the flashes were next to them and, and they were pointing towards uh, the center of the dance floor. Luckily, they happened to do their first dance right in the middle of the dance floor, <laughs> which added to the symmetry. Um, but having your flashes set up and pointed to the middle of the dance floor is really important just so that you um, you always have light where you want it. Um, if you find that the dance floor and the people on the dance floor are too spread out, then yeah, you want to pull the flashes back off of the dance floor further away so that you don't have uh, the flash too close to some people. So it's really bright on them and then dark on the other people. Um, one of the things, again, we cover this in the course that I teach, but we can't really talk about it too much here because it's such a big topic is um, light fall off. And uh, as, as, as the light goes and the, whatever's closest to the light is gonna be so much brighter than what's further away from the light. Uh, it's kind of like if you, if you think of it like a water hose, if you had a water hose turned on to like sprinkler mode, so it's a really like kind of soft sprinkler mode and you were 10 feet away from it and just getting sprinkled with it, like it would, it would kind of hit you and get you wet, but it wouldn't really do anything. But if your face was like two inches away from it and you turned on sprinkler mode, it's not very comfortable. Like it's a lot stronger right when it comes out of the sprinkler. Flash is the same way. The closer you are to the flash, the stronger, the brighter it is on you. Um, so in this image, if you look at the guy standing on the left-hand side, uh, Armsman over there, the side of his face, the kind of back and side of his face is being lit up by that flash. That's actually pretty bright on his face and that's blowing out his skin. Whereas the same flash that's hitting uh, some of the people that are sitting at the tables there, they're easily probably 10 times further away from the flash than he is. And it's barely even lighting them up, right? So it's, it's lighting up the couple in the middle of the dance floor a bit it's putting light on them. You can see the shadows on her hip and you can see that the light is getting on them, but it's not uh, blowing them out. Whereas the people who are just a couple feet away from the flashes that are. So all that to say, if you find that the people are too close to your flashes, then yeah, you should move your flashes back so that it lights up everything evenly rather than lighting up some things way brighter and some things way darker. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I think that was a, a, great, descri a great description of it. Good. Um, okay, so I do want to move on to our third one, and then we've got lots more time that we can ask more questions and, and dive more into it. Um, so I'm going to talk about kickers and a boom. <laughs> so number three is kickers and a boom. So kickers, again, like I've, we've been talking about the whole time, is, is just a flash that's on a stand that you place somewhere. But now we've got a boom. So what I call a boom is essentially a flash on a monopod. So I could say kickers on a monopod, but it doesn't sound as cool as kickers on a boom. So kickers and a boom is, is the third setup. And basically what this is allowing is for your flash to not be on camera anymore, but now it's on a monopod that you can kind of pick and choose what you're going to light up. And there's a lot of actually fun things that come with this. So a boom allows you to target what you want. You want to target your light onto what you want to target it onto. So if you're in the middle of the dance floor and you've got an on-camera flash, you're gonna light up whatever's directly in front of you. But if you have a boom, if you've got a monopod with a flash on it, you can actually reach up nice and high and you can still have a front facing light, but you can reach over top of the shoulders of the people that are right in front of you. And you can light up the person in the middle of the circle who's doing a crazy dance move, but then you don't have to light up the shoulders of the people who are right in front of you. So you can get that layer in your image. There's lots of things you can do with this. Um, one of the options that you can do in this case um, is actually used outside. So this was 
uh, outside, uh, kind of the middle of the reception. It was, uh, well, I guess it was maybe later on in the reception uh, while we were getting out to do sparkler photos. Uh, but it was pretty dark outside and it started to rain and they really wanted photos with the rain. So what we did was we had a kicker go behind them. So it's going to be rim lighting them. As you can see that light pretty obviously that it's lighting up the whole, uh, like the, the rim of their bodies. And then off to the left hand side of the image, you can tell it's the left hand side because of the shadow that's on, like, let's say her nose and the shadow that comes from his uh, shoulder onto her chest. The light's coming from the left hand side and it's up on a boom on a monopod with a flash on it. You can kind of see even if you draw a line from on the line that's on her um, on her dress at the bottom underneath her flowers. If you draw a line from there to the railing, you can see how high the boom was up. And we had to get it nice and high so that we'd get the light on her face and not uh, not have that um, railing send a shadow too far across her body. Um, so this is using a kicker and a boom, a monopod, it's up nice and high. And all that I have to do is find the place I want to go, and then I have to get someone to hold it. Um, so that's with not me holding it, obviously, in this image. Um, one of the things that you'll find is one-handed shooting with a monopod. Um, so shoot wide is what I would say. Uh, use a wide angle lens and have it set on its focus so that you're not trying to always refocus as you're shooting because you're going to be using one hand when you're doing this and holding the monopod in the other hand. So you want to be able to just leave the zoom at where it's at. You want to leave the focus at where it's at and shoot when people are a certain distance away from you. Um, so a lot of times what I end up doing is keeping people around four to six feet away from me. I'm focused at around the four to five foot uh, distance so that with a wide angle lens, they're pretty much always in focus. Even if they're three feet away from me or 10 feet away from me, they're pretty much reasonably in focus. Um, but I'm shooting wide because I'm shooting one-handed. So here's one situation, <laughs> which I won't leave it on here very long, but um, these, this guy was teaching the other guy how to do the Michael Jackson moves. And I was able to have my uh, boom, so my monopod with the flash that lights them up. And then as you can see, there's a kicker coming from the side. You can see all the shadows on the side uh, that from their bodies, you can see that the flash is coming from the right hand side. And then this guy pointing out his, his little arm pointing out what's going on. Um, so I can light them up well and light up the side and give dimension because of the boom and because of the kicker. Now, here's one of the things that I would suggest to you as uh, not even a flash tip. <laughs> this is like a business tip. Pass it off, make friends. It works. So You've got this flash that's on a boom that you're walking around with and shooting and finding all these interesting directions and things to do. And then if you give it to someone, if you give it to your assistant, they can help you and you can get more interesting angles. But if you actually give it to like a guest, someone that you've made a bit of a connection with, um, you might find that that guest actually gets a little more invested with you and potentially could even hire you for their wedding. Um, so as a ex specific example of this, I hope that this tip alone helps book you another wedding. Um, this is a specific example of a couple who wanted to get photos on the dock that was next to where they were having their reception. And I knew that at the time, because of the clouds and because of the sunset, how it was, we needed to have flash. And so I had my boom already set up and I could kind of bring it wherever I wanted to. But I also knew that there was this guy who was every once in a while kind of talking about like what I was doing and he seemed really interested and I knew that he was dating a girl so he'd probably get engaged at some point so and he was tall <laughs> so I actually gave him my my monopod the boom with the flash on it and said hey could you come over here and help me out for a second and, and light them up I'll show you what it, what, it, what it looks like once I'm done he's like oh yeah of course so he's standing on the on the sand next to us here uh, next to the dock and he's got the boom up nice and high and he's lighting them up uh, and I'm getting my shot and then I showed him the shot and he loved it for the rest of the night. He was totally like putty in my hands. He just, he wanted to like be involved and he wanted to do more. He kept bragging to other people that he was a part of the photography team and he just loved it. It was a fun way to get him involved. Well, this is him. When he got married a year later, uh, the first decision that they made was hiring us. And he said, there's no way I'm going to get married without having Matt and Carissa there. And I think it was largely because we got him involved in that little process of making one image. So this is one of our favorite weddings of all time. And we did it because we were able to make friends with a person at a shoot and they got to be involved in getting a photo taken. 
Um, we didn't like we actually took his photo at the wedding and took a couple cool photos of him, uh, him with his now wife, but at that time girlfriend. Um, so he got some photos of him himself at that wedding that he must have, I'm sure, liked. But he also was a part of making an image and he enjoyed the process of being part of it and and the fun that came with that. And so because of that connection, uh, they brought us to their wedding. And so that's just one thing that I would highly suggest that you do is always be thinking about marketing. This wedding photography is a performance sport. <laughs> You're going to get tired doing it, but people are watching you and people are thinking, oh, I wonder if they'd be good for this friend's wedding. I wonder if they'd be good for my wedding. People are watching you while you're working. So yes, do your best to get images for your clients. Do your best uh, at all times for the people who've hired you. But also keep in mind that you're allowed to have fun. You're allowed to have fun with other people that are at the wedding as well. And if you're doing things that allow uh, someone else to have fun and that the couple gets what they want and has more fun as well, that's a win-win-win. So we want as many of those as we can. So that's what I would suggest is part of the, the magic of having a, uh, a flash on a monopod or a boom, as I'd call it, is that you actually have the opportunity to allow somebody in to the creative process with your images. And I would strongly suggest you take that. Um, so I want to actually just mention really quickly right now that the course that I had mentioned that we teach at the International Academy of Wedding Photographers is actually on special right now for you because you are at this shoot.edit um, webinar. Now, I'm not going to last long on here, so I want you to just write this down. Um, it is available for you for only $97. So it's regularly $299. You're getting this for the third of the price that it regularly cost. All you have to do is use the coupon code SDE flash, shoot.edit flash. That's the coupon code that you'll use. And here's the link that you can screenshot right now or write it down bit.ly slash flash course 97. And that's going to allow you to get access to the course that teaches all about off camera flash, every single thing that you would need to know about off camera flash, all the settings and, uh, and gear and all of that kind of stuff. Um, this will teach you everything you need to know. Um, and you'll be able to use a lot of these lighting setups that I've talked about today uh, to get great images at your wedding. So that's the flash course. And this is just what it looks like, just so you know to what, what to expect when you get to the website itself. Um, so we talk about things like the essential equipment that's needed and exactly how to use it, a three-step system to achieving perfect exposure, adjusting your settings to balance natural and artificial light. Like I was talking about at the beginning, it's really important to know how to keep your style rather than uh, just using flash and, and making, it, making it bright. You want to actually make it look like your work. Um, also, positioning your flashes in order to achieve the look that you desire and posing your subjects when using flash, which is very different from posing your subjects in natural light. Um, so how to pose them and light them so that you can flatter their figure and their face and then also get the image that you want. So that's the course that we're talking about uh, when we talk about the off-camera flash course. And again, that link is bit.ly slash flash course 97. Awesome. And we will definitely get uh, the link out and the code that you guys have. We'll get that into the chats for everyone so that uh, that way you don't have to try to screenshot it and type it in. And I know sometimes like everything is case <laughs> sensitive these days. So. For sure, for sure. so we'll definitely get that into the chat so that everybody uh, has that opportunity to go check it out. And, you know, Matt, you shared some really, really great tips with us today. And so I can only imagine that that is just a little segment of what people could actually learn in your right, full right. length course. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I want to make sure that this webinar is as useful as possible um, and give you the like this, the the diagrams and the uh, setups that will help you get the kind of images that you want. Um, obviously, as we know, there's so much that goes into this. So getting into all the settings and all that stuff is a little bit hard to do in this kind of situation. But in the course, there are um, there are live demonstrations. You see me on a shoot uh, doing the actual uh, shoot. And so you, you kind of get to watch the whole thing. And then the rest of it is all like eight hours of in-class teaching about using flashes and all of the gear and all the settings and how to make sure that no matter what your situation you're in, you actually get the right exposure, that you get your flashes talking to each other properly and that you're able to light exactly how you want. Awesome. Love it. Love it. Um, all right. So let's see. I see where is this quick Q&A time for the last 
yeah, segment so that we just talked about. That well, this would be for everything. So. <laughs> oh, this is everything. Okay. This is everything. Yeah. So if you've got any questions, definitely <laughs> let me know. I will answer anything. Perfect. Okay. Well, I have a I have a list here, so we'll see uh, how many we can go through. Good. I got um, about two and a half minutes. Is that okay? Perfect. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. This really is quick Q and A time. <laughs> no. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So let's see. Then going back um, when we were talking about kind of the on camera with the kicker. Yeah. Um, when when you're doing that, do you recommend using you know the TTL mode for your kicker and your on camera flash? Or I know early on you're like manual everything. Uh, right. What are your recommendations with that? Yeah, great question. Um, the hard thing with TTL and kickers is that when the camera can see the flash in its view, so when the the kicker is actually being seen by the camera, it usually tricks the TTL settings and it will make your flash either not go off at all or go off uh, like the lowest possible power setting. So I almost always will have my kickers on manual. And that being said, I will almost always have them on the second lowest manual power setting that's possible. So on my flashes, that is one over 64. Now on a lot of flashes, they'll go to one over 28 as the lowest one. I usually go up uh, one stop from there just so that I have a little bit of leeway if I need to go down or if I need to go up. Uh, but basically, I'm going to have my flashes, my my kickers, set to 1 over 64. And then I'm going to uh, bring my ISO and my settings up of, of aperture and exposure uh, or sh of shutter and bring it up to the point that I can basically illuminate everything with ambient and flash. Um, I'm going to do that before I usually turn on my on-camera flash because my on-camera flash is going to be more of a fill flash if I even use it. Um, so the on-camera flash in the, the question that you just asked can potentially be in TTL mode or in manual mode. Um, what I usually find is that I, if I'm in a room that the ceiling is always the same distance and the wall is always the same distance and I'm just moving around, I will bounce my on-camera flash and I'll leave it on a manual setting. Um, if I have it on TTL, I will make sure that, uh, or sorry, if I have a situation where the position is changing, what I'm bouncing off is changing, or um, if I'm not bouncing on anything and I'm actually just facing it towards the people, then I will have it on TTL because it can manually tell how bright it needs to fill up the image. Um, so a lot of times what I'll do if it's on camera and in TTL is I'll have the flash card uh, taken up so that my flash is facing a, a direction more up so it's not gonna light up their feet as much as it is their face. And the flash card is out so that it puts a little bit more light forward so that it lights them up and gives a little bit of catch light into anybody's eyes that are actually looking at the camera. Um, okay, okay, great, uh, great, great response. Um, super helpful. So let's see, moving on then to my next question. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like this happens, you know, so, so often, especially at, at weddings is um, you get everything set up, you have all of these, you know, great lighting uh, setups and then all of a sudden your flash doesn't fire and yeah. then you either have to like go over and see what's happening you're trying to you know resync everything do you have any suggestions for you know what to do so that that doesn't happen do you have any you know tricks up your sleeve when it comes to that yeah for sure um i'm gonna be honest one of the main reasons that flashes don't fire it actually kind of boils down to user error <laughs> so I, hopefully that doesn't make too many people feel bad because i've been there so many times um, but usually what it is, is your battery's not being charged enough. And so I want you all to just be very, uh, uh, I guess like not conscientious, but like think about your batteries um, and making sure that you have them charged and that you are not putting in batteries that were used at like a week ago, that you charge them each time um, because you need to make sure that uh, it has every chance of working properly. And if your batteries are low, that's uh, one of the main reasons why sometimes it'll stop firing and you'll have to go over and turn it off and turn it on and then it works again. And you're thinking, why does this keep doing this? Well, a lot of times it boils down to your batteries. Um, so that's the main thing to think about. But the other thing is um, the gear that you use, uh, there's something to be said for quality gear and uh, you kind of get what you pay for sometimes. Um, that being said, one of the kind of cheapest but best bang for your buck options that we've found is the Yongnuo system, 
because it uses kind of a clamp system rather than a little switch that a lot of the Nikon systems will use for clamping your transceiver to your camera or your flash to your transceiver. And so it makes it way more sturdy so that the flash won't kind of jiggle off if, it, if the stand gets hit. Um, the connection points always stay connected. Uh, so that's one main thing that I would think that uh, you should think about is making sure that your flashes and your transceivers are all very sturdy and that they stay connected. They don't move around if the stand gets jiggled. Um, aside from that, uh, there's not a lot you can do if something comes up and they become unsynced. Um, you, you basically just need to, whenever you can, uh, keep it uh, live. Um, a lot, of, um, a lot of flash systems will go to sleep uh, just to save battery power, which is good. It's a good option to have, um, but sometimes that will increase the chances of a disconnection happening. So you want to try to get, um, try, try to every once in a while be firing off the flash just as, as like almost test shots to make sure that you're still connected and that you're still um, getting exactly what you want out of the flashes. Um, something just to remember as well is that there is a difference between radio trigger and infrared trigger. Um, so you want to ideally, if you can find the gear and, and the money to get the gear, you want to get radio transmitting um, uh, transmitters, transceivers, so that you can for sure fire, even if you're around a corner or if you're you're physically being blocked by the like by being able to see the flash itself. With radio trigger, it goes through walls and it goes around corners and it goes up to hundreds of feet. So you want that kind of system so that you always have it go off. Great, great, great advice. And, you know, uh, the first part of your response, it reminded me of when we were talking about earlier about batteries and just always making sure you have enough. And, you know, it sounds like, especially when your flash isn't firing, it could just be a good idea to, you know, check those batteries, put yeah. new ones in just to see if that is a quick fix. I think there's two things that I've always found in, in photography that are like that your batteries and your memory cards. Oh, it, yeah. It just sucks <laughs> when you get to the point that, you've like filled up memory cards and you still have to shoot more be just because you didn't have enough memory cards. So just buying more memory cards. I know it costs money, but this is a job and you need to do the best you can for your clients. So have enough memory cards to be able to shoot three weddings on a weekend and not have to reformat. <laughs> right. Uh, lots of memory as well. Have lots of batteries so that you can always be able to get that shot and you don't have to be, you know, trying to find batteries somewhere or, not use a flash because you ran out of batteries. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those things that it, it takes a little bit of dedication to a little bit of extra investment, but it pays off in the long run for your sanity. <laughs> it does, it totally does. All right, uh, let's see, another question for you. Um, outdoor nighttime weddings, maybe wanting to do a dramatic shot at the end, even, even sometimes sparkler image shots. Mm -hmm. uh, recommendations, would all of your the setups that you went through with us today, would all of those work for an outdoor wedding? Um, or do you have like a, a, a go-to setup when you do have, you know, a nighttime shot that you need to get? I would say 100% these would all be usable and perfect to use at an outdoor wedding. Um, because none of the setups that I talked about required bouncing any light off of any walls. So I did mention a couple times that you can, uh, with your on-camera flash, bounce the light off of walls. But you don't have to. A lot of times you can just use your flash um, as a fill light, popping a little bit of light forwards or on a boom, on a monopod. Um, so, yeah, I would use any of these setups in an outdoor uh, setup as well. Um, one of the things just to remember is that, like I was kind of saying, your kicker can be used as a front light sometimes. And when you have two of them set up, you can interchange them. You can go from one side shooting and it's a front light and back light go from the other side shooting and it's a front light and back light reversed or go from in between them and now you've got symmetrical lighting. Um, so a lot of times in outdoor weddings, there is nothing to make symmetry. Um, it's just, there's, there's nothing usually around in an outdoor wedding that will look symmetrical, but your flashes can. And so you can add another element to your images and your composition by having symmetrical flashes in your images. Um, so yeah, when it comes to uh, an outdoor wedding in the evening, especially, yes, I would definitely use the same systems, same setups. Um, I might move my flashes a little bit higher because they are the only light sources at that point that are like, like main light sources. And so I move them higher so that uh, a person's head that is maybe three feet away from another person's head doesn't cast a shadow onto them as often. Uh, that's just one thing to be kind of conscious about is, is what, where your shadows are being cast. 
Right. Um, and now the other thing you were saying about kind of like the late night photo that they want like an epic photo or a sparkler photo um, for the more kind of epic late night photos, usually you would do it with one or two flashes. You would almost never do it with an on-camera flash and you would just get creative with the, the setup and the, and the location that you're at. Um, so like we've done photos in front of castles where we just use one flash to light up the couple, but the rest of our settings are set for the castle itself. And it's really easy to get a great epic looking image that just uses one flash to light up your couple. Uh, a lot of times we'll use a kicker on the floor. So on the little flash foot on the floor behind the couple facing up towards them so that it lights up uh, the room around them even, but mostly sort of gives them, them a rim light. So it makes them stand out and separates them from the background. Um, now thinking about sparkler photos, I almost always, and I, I have a course on sparkler photos. If you want to go to this, the, the school and check out that course, um, I, I, I think I have the only course out there about how to do sparkler photos because uh, I've been doing it for a long time. But <laughs> my, my system of sparkler photos is your camera's on, the, on a tripod for about 30 seconds uh, taking the photo. I'm running through the image like a crazy man, sweating my face off and, <laughs> and moving the sparkler all around to draw whatever I'm going to draw. And then at the end of it, I have to run in and use my flash and pop it off on a, in, a situ in a place that's going to, you know, make them look good, but also light them up in the image. Um, so in that case, I usually just have the flash bare bulb right in my hand and I'm running up and lighting them. So it's not necessarily a system where I have stands set up and where I'm triggering anything. I'm actually manually doing it myself. Wow, that's that's awesome. I feel like we could have an entire like training on how you do sparkler images. Oh man, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. oh, but awesome. you know what? Wow. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest. Um, sparkler images in general put me on the map as far as a educator and photographer in my area. And it was such a random situation that even got me there. But um, at the time, like six years ago. Uh, I started doing them and just for fun and then they caught on really quickly. And so I, it was, it was one of those things that really set me apart and allowed me to um, charge more in my area. And a lot of the people that I've taught sparkler photos to have said the same because there still aren't very many people in every area that know how to do them well. And so a person who wants those and sees those on your website goes, Oh, Oh, they know how to do this. Oh, okay. They must be good. And so it's one of those things that I would, I would strongly recommend you check out the course and just try them yourself um, because it's still a differentiating factor for me six years later in my industry. That's great. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get a link out for, for that so that everybody can easily find it rather than trying to you know, sure. go through the site. So we'll get a link out for that, definitely. Um, gosh, I have so many other questions, but I'm going to ask one more. Okay. Um, and I, I love asking this one. If... If photographers can go out and do, you know, one thing either, you know, today or before, you know, their next shoot in regards to off camera flash and just improving and practicing this skill, what do you recommend that they do? Wow. Great question. <laughs> to um, put you on the spot, you know. <laughs> no, I like it though. Um, for, for me, the, the biggest thing is that they just need to go practice and they need to be comfortable getting settings quickly. Um, so the, the, my, my biggest problem with people doing off camera flash before they're ready is that it wrecks someone's wedding day in a way. Um, now obviously it's not going to wreck their wedding day, but it limits the amount of photos and meaningful photos that they could get because the photographer is taking the time to learn on the job. And I, I just don't think that's the way to do it. Now, if you're being paid for a job, I think you should uh, be as confident as possible in that job and do things that are within your style and your ability. Now, if you want to make more money with this job, then you need to increase your ability. Um, if you ever want to make more money in general, you need to educate yourself and you need to challenge yourself. So what I would say is that you need to practice lighting things up in your room when it's dark. You need to practice knowing how to use your flash backwards and forwards. Um, you need to practice, practice, practice. That's how you're going to get better. And my strongest suggestion that I'm trying not to be self-serving with this because of obviously we do courses that make money for us, but my strongest suggestion is to not do it on your own, but to take the advice from people who've done it before you, learn their systems and apply it faster. That's just going to make you more money faster. Like I think it just makes so much 
more sense than trying to learn it yourself and taking longer? Why would you not take the kind of jump start and do a course so that you can learn it faster, get it into your portfolio faster, and start charging more money faster? That's that's kind of my thought on all of this kind of stuff. Um, is there's there's the option of a jump start? Why not take it? Usually, the reason why not to take it is because you can't afford it. Um, but again, I think that you can't afford not to because you're essentially saying that over the year, if I invest whatever it is, a hundred, two hundred dollars, thousand dollars, will I make more than that in this year because of that investment? And if you can, if you can't say yes, then don't invest in that at all. But if you can say, yeah, it's probably going to make me more in the long run, then it doesn't make sense to me at all to not do it um, unless there are just unbearable uh, money concerns in your life at this moment. And in, in that case, obviously, don't don't put your family's health at risk in order to invest in things. Um, but that's what I would say is that like treat this like a business, invest in your business, and it'll invest back in you. It'll It'll pay off if you are dedicated. Awesome. Uh, well, hey, Matt, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Uh, of course. You know, you had some really, really great insights on just different setups to use, recommended equipment. Uh, we'll definitely get another link out there for your course. And then um, I know you also had a link that we'll get out for the additional diagrams that people can go and download. For sure. So yeah. we'll definitely get those uh, in the chats one more time. And as a reminder to everybody tuning in, uh, you'll get an email shortly after this that does include the recording and some helpful links that were shared throughout this. And that'll be emailed to you within the next few hours and the recording, uh, you'll have 48 hours to rewatch it as many times as you want and <laughs> just getting more and more tips that Matt shared today. So again, you know, thank you everyone for being here, Matt, especially for you. Thank you for taking the time and just, you know, chatting with me today and sharing yeah. your expertise. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. And for all you guys watching, if you want to get in touch with us, you can definitely do that easily through um, the Academy. So you can go to onlinephotoacademy.com uh, or feel free to send me an email, matt at onlinephotoacademy.com. I'm happy to open up a conversation. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. And again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Until next time.